Hello and welcome to SciCam, the online science magazine show. I'm Michael Quintario and joining me this week are Sonia Dunbar. Hello. And Deborah Durbin. Hey. And um, today we're going to be covering uh, bees, fusion and flight. Uh, so if you've got any questions about those, stick them in the question and answer section of the page that you are. And uh, Sonia, if you could uh, start us off with uh, saying us, what's the news with bees? Bees? Um, well, unfortunately bees have been in the news a lot recently. Um, and it's largely, well, not for good reasons, because actually our honeybees and bumblebees are rather in peril. And so today I'm actually going to summarize the research of three different papers that have been published um, just at the start of this year alone. And the first of those is talking about the European honeybee, uh, which is Apis mellifera. And the European honeybee is incredibly important for pollination around the world. Um, it pollinates about 90 uh, major commercial crops. and it's actually valued, sort of, its service of pollination is valued at $14.6 billion to the US each year. So bees are really big business, but they are very much in decline. Um, and the first of the three papers uh, is from a team at the University of Reading. And they have shown that it seems that Britain only has about a quarter of the honeybees that it really needs to pollinate all its crops. And in fact, Europe as a whole, they have estimated, need about 7 million more honeybees to pollinate not just food crops, but also a booming biofuel industry. And so, as a result of the move towards more renewable fuels and subsidies encouraging the growth of biofuel crops, um, the areas planted with oil crops, such as things like oilseed rape, have increased by about a third across the land surface of Europe. And unsurprisingly, all these extra plants need pollinating. So how are we coping at the moment? Well, the authors believe that basically all the wild pollinators that they can't really include in their calculations um, are, well, making up the loss. But relying on these species, especially when their habitats and their uh, lives are at risk is a move that could jeopardize UK agriculture in the future. So how do we go about solving the problem? How do we protect our bees? Um, well, we need to look at habitat protection and uh, changing farming methods to protect our pollinators. And steps are being taken in the right direction. Um, for example, at the moment, uh, there is a ban on neonicotinoid pesticides, which research has suggested disrupts the immune system in bees, um, which would make them more, success, uh, more susceptible to infections and viruses and things. And talking about viruses uh, leads me on to the two other papers that I want to talk about today. So over the last few years, you might have heard the term colony collapse disorder. And Colony Collapse Disorder is the name given to the abrupt disappearance of the worker bees in a bee colony or beehive, um, usually as autumn or winter sets in. And the phenomenon that this disorder has been responsible for the loss of about 10 million beehives over the last six years. And the most bewildering thing really about the disorder is simply how difficult it has been to pinpoint its cause. There have been all sorts of uh, hypotheses from parasites, pesticides, poor nutrition, or a combination of all three, suggested as the reason for these unexpected deaths, these disappearances. But new research from uh, some scientists, uh, a collaboration actually between America and China, um, has identified a somewhat unexpected virus, which they've shown is having a negative impact on bee colonies. And the surprise, really, uh, comes from the fact that this virus, which is called tobacco ring spot virus, well, it is, as its name hints, a virus of plants, not bees at all. Um, 
And the concern comes from the fact that this virus seems to have managed to evolve to use the bee as a host. Now, I should say at this point, viruses being carried by insects isn't something new. But what they found with the bees was unusual because normally if a virus is just being carried by an insect, it will stay restricted to its mouth and its gut, so the areas where um, the insect has taken up the virus along with all the other plant material that it's feeding on, and then it can be injected into the next plant. This is not the case in the bees. These bees have the virus replicating in all cells of their body, and actually they have particularly low levels in the gut. <coughs> What's most concerning for the bees is that particularly as, they, as the time they've been infected increases, it seems that the virus gathers in very uh, large amounts in the cells of its nervous system. And currently the researchers are suggesting that this buildup of virus in the nervous system would be likely to kill bees, perhaps at a sort of unexpected moment. Um, and it could be as the winter sets in and conditions get harsher that suddenly this really sort of impacts upon the bees. Now, sadly, the sort of the story doesn't quite end there because actually bees still have several other viruses in them that are, uh, that are making it hard really for the researchers to definitively prove that it is this one virus that is causing a colony collapse disorder. But it is at least a start, and quite a worrying one, really, um, considering that this virus has made the jump from a plant to an insect. And sadly, it isn't actually just honeybees that are at risk um, from these pathogens. So the third paper that I wanted to uh, mention was that researchers have found that there are two honeybee pathogens, um, the deformed wing virus and a fungal parasite, have made the leap into bumblebees, which is a less extreme jump than from plants into bees, but it's still an, uh, a species jump. <coughs> and the presence of these uh, pathogens in the bumblebee uh, is shortening lifespan of bumblebees, which is definitely bad news, uh, especially because bumblebees were already doing very badly around the world. In fact, one of the British species, Cullum bumblebee, recently became extinct. So, the researchers uh, from that paper now were trying to see if the neonicotinoid pesticides that I mentioned earlier are having the same effect on bumblebee immunity as they seem to have on honeybee immunity, as, well, that would make matters worse. So, with all this bad news, how will bees fare in years to come? Well, to be honest, the future looks very uncertain for our little humble pollinator, um, especially as two of the companies that make uh, the neonicotinoid pesticides are trying to overturn the ban on their use. But at least research is being done, and people are starting to listen and notice the plight, if not the flight, of the bumblebee. And don't despair. It's not just big companies uh, and scientists that can make a difference. We can all help bees by growing bee-friendly plants uh, in the green spaces we have available, no matter how big or small. You could add things like a, the beautiful snapdragon, antirhinum, to your flower bed, or wonderfully scented lavender. If you've got a bit more space, uh, the buddleia or butterfly bush is also a, a good bee plant. And it won't just be bees that you encourage. A whole range of British wildlife will wildlife will appreciate your help in, well, making the urban jungle that bit greener. And it's good for us too to get outside. So, spring is here. Go outside and get planting. Uh, thank Back you very much for that, Sonia. Uh, always nice to end on an upbeat note after what's actually quite a depressing set of papers. Sadly, yeah, be bees are in trouble. <laughs> But uh, it's good to know that this research is being done, so hopefully you will know better what to actually do to, to solve the problems. Yeah. And, well, as I said, we can all do our own little bit to try and give them a hand. Oh, and you, you mentioned uh, several different types of uh, bee there. 
Uh, yes. could, you, could you explain the difference a little bit more? Uh, well, honeybees and bumblebees are actually really quite different um, because uh, the way we define a species, um, the, there's a series of classification and basically it goes from very broad, right from kingdom, all the way down to an individual species. Um, and the level above species we call genus. Um, and honeybees are actually a different genus to bumblebees. And the thing that really distinguishes them is the fact that they make and store honey, which um, we use, and they make these uh, huge nests out of wax. Um, whereas bumblebees, well, don't, uh, effectively, and they are actually an entirely different genus. Um, they're part of the bombus genus in the bee family. So uh, the, the honeybees are the ones that we're effectively farming while the bumblebees are just bumbling about. To some extent, although bumblebees do a very important role in pollinating as well. But yeah, the ones we tend to have the hives of um, are honeybees. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that, Sonia. Uh, we're now uh, moving more towards the physics end of things with um, a look at the basics of flight. Because there are things that sometimes people think they know about flight, and there's one really big misconception that I'm going to get to later. But I'm going to just go from the very basics and actually just talk about um, and actually just talk about what's going on and how anything that's heavier than air can fly in the first place. Because we all know that, that things that are less dense than air can fly. When you see a um, hot air balloon going, is because all the gas inside the balloon actually floats upwards because of what's called the Archimedes effect. And this is actually the same thing that keeps stuff floating in water or uh, uh, any other dense liquid. And it's just because the density is lower than whatever the fluid, which is liquid or gas, that they're displacing. And that actually gives you a force upwards which is equal to the difference in the densities between the two materials times by the volume of the material. Uh, and that gives you your overall force after you've taken weight, the weight of the material inside to, into account. And so that's how, that, that, that's how hot air balloons float. But in a way, they're also doing what, this, what basically every other thing that flies is doing, and that's getting a push upwards by pushing something else down. Mm -hmm. And in the case of the, the hot air balloon, you, they are actually slightly more pushing the air below them down more than the air above them, they're pushing up. And this gives them a force, and this is due to what we call Newton's third law of motion. You might have heard it before. It says that every force has an equal and opposite reaction force. So if you push on something else, it pushes back on you. And so in that case, it's the, the, the outside of the hot air balloon is actually pushing against the molecules in the air around it. And because the pressure is slightly higher underneath it, then it's actually pushing more air molecules down at the bottom, pushing harder down at the bottom than it is at the top. So the hot air balloon pushes down, the air pushes up, and the hot air balloon rises. But when you come to something like a rocket, what's actually getting pushed down is all the fuel, the gases that have been created by the combustion of the fuel inside the rocket. And so all that is getting spewed out the bottom, all that is getting pushed down. And because the rocket is pushing that down, you get a reaction pushing the rocket up. Now when you actually come to birds and insects and airplanes, what they're all doing is actually very definitely, clearly, just pushing the air down. But they do this in slightly different ways. Oh, th first thing to say here is that there's an old urban myth that science proved that bees can't fly. And this is just, just an urban myth. They haven't really been able to track down where it came from. But it looks like if you, if you, it's a back of the envelope calculation where they're just assuming really stupid things about bees, like the fact that their wings are stiff and they're basically just flying as if they were a, sti a stiff winged aircraft. And that's clearly not the case. And this just shows when you're thinking about things in a scientific manner, you have to be very careful with what assumptions you make and when you start putting things into your model. 
because if you put garbage assumptions in, you're going to get garbage results out, and you actually have to be very careful there. So that, that, that's just an urban myth. Scientists never said, oh, no, bees can't fly, because scientists would have looked at the bees and said, yes, yes, they can. And we just have to work out where our model is wrong and fix that. But when you come to the uh, birds are flying, uh, you actually got most birds are, are flapping their wings in such a way so that when they're flapping and pushing down, they're very clearly pushing some air down. Well, they bring their wings almost tighter into their body so that when the wing is going back upwards, it's not pushing anything like so much air upwards. So when they have the down flap, they're pushing the air down, and by the Newton's third law of motion, that means there's a reaction force pushing the birds up. But when they bring them in, because they're bringing them in and their surface area, they're not going as fast, the, they're pushing a much smaller amount of air up. So there's a much smaller force on them down. And there's also lots of other ways that uh, birds take advantage of things. They will, they will glide in a similar way to gliders, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about how that works when they get onto airplanes. And they also take advantage of thermals, which are columns of hot air that are rising. And of course, as that's rising, it hits the bottom of their wing, the wing pushes it down, and so the bird gets pushed up again. But hummingbirds are a little bit different. And this is something that was only really appreciated um, a couple of, couple of years ago, I think in late 2011 when some people actually looked at some hummingbirds. They tried to film them with an x-ray camera and actually found they were getting too blurry pictures because the wings were moving too fast. Because um, what, what the difference between hummingbirds and other birds is, hummingbirds yeah. are effectively just feathering their wings. So rather than flapping down and coming in and up and down hard and then up, what they're actually doing is they're feathering their wings back and forth. And each, each flap of it, when their wings are coming in, they're, pu they're pushing this one, one, one way, they're pushing air down, and then they twist the wing so that when it's going back the other way, again, it's pushing air down. And scientists weren't sure exactly how they were doing it, how their skeletons and muscles were moving in order to be able to do that. And in the end, to actually get nice measurements with that, they have to effectively put, I believe it was little balls of silver and attach them to the wings of the hummingbirds so they can actually just track those using the x-ray camera and actually work out how they manage to twist their wings like that. Another interesting bird flight paper that's come out um, at the start of this year what involves um, why birds fly in a V. And now you might feel that this was a solved problem and that we've known this for years and years and years. And it's a case that we've fought this for years and years and years and rather than just sitting behind other birds in the V and that getting making it easier for them to fly. We also thought that the timing of their wing beats might also help, but we've never actually been able to prove this. But a bunch of people actually reared some ibises and trained them to effectively follow humans so they could get them to follow a small aircraft. And they would follow it in this V. But because they were reared by humans and trained to accept, accept them, it was quite easy for them to give, basically attach data loggers onto them so they could actually read the t precise timings of each wing beat. And they can force it to follow the plane and then at the other end take the data loggers off the birds and actually read out the results. And it does turn out that when the birds are beating their wings down, that's when they've got a bit of an updraft from the beating of the wing of the bird in front. So the bird in front, the air is coming back from the bird in front, and it's kind of almost rotating. And when the birds behind are pushing down on it, they actually catch it when the air is already coming up, which means they can give a bigger push to it, and actually then get a bigger, um, a bigger force upwards to keep them flying, and it just makes it all a lot more energetically efficient. So even though it's only confirming something that we suspected for quite a long time, it was quite a nice result. So now I'm just going to finish off by talking a little bit about what I'm sure you all actually really care about, which is aircraft wings. And the key point to remember is that the aircraft wings are pushing air down. The, 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 key, the explanation that some people give is that in the aerofoil, you actually have a longer surface along the top than on the bottom, and the air has to go faster along the surface on the top in order to meet up with the air that goes a shorter distance on the, on the bottom. Faster air will give you a lower pressure, and that will mean that you actually have higher pressure on the bottom, low pressure on the top, and a force pushing 
the aircraft up. But the problem with that is, why does the air have to meet up at the back? And the answer is, it doesn't. And you can, you can have aircraft wings, which are entirely symmetric. Or, and of course, aircraft, some aircraft can fly upside down. So if that was the case, the lift would be pushing in entirely the wrong direction. But what, what we really care about is what they tend to call the angle of attack, which is effectively, you can think of it as how much you change the angle of the air coming, that, that is effectively coming towards you as you're flying along at a quick speed. It's not really moving relative to you, but you, you get the idea. If you're going fast, it se seems as if the air is coming towards you at that speed. And how you actually change the direction that's going in. And if you imagine just a simple wing that's just at a slight angle upwards, and the air coming in is going to bounce off that wing and get deflected downwards. And so you're pushing the air downwards, which means that the air is pushing the wing upwards. And it's more interesting than that, because actually because of the fluid dynamics of the situation, you also get air that's coming above it. It's kind of effectively getting sucked down the shape of the wing. And this is where the aerofoil comes in, because the aerofoil wings are actually designed to really exacerbate its effect and really get that change in direction, so you're actually getting a large push on the air. And that's what's actually the push on your the wing, the aerofoil, pushes the air downwards, and then um, the air pushes back on the wing, pushes it back upwards. But it doesn't matter if you're upside down, because you just change the angle that you're flying at, and then effectively your wing is pushing in the right direction again. So if you kind of just flip it upside down, yeah, you get the idea. So long as you're always making sure that the air is deflecting off your wing and being pushed down, or kind of effectively getting sucked down by air pressure as it flows over the, flows over the wing, then that's how you get the lift. And also this is why some aircraft have a uh, stall angle, because it's basically the point where they won't be able to go, be going fast enough at whatever that angle is to actually be pushing enough air downwards in order to get the lift force. And so it all depends on the angle of the wing. And uh, so, so there you have it, the basics of flight in birds, a little bit about bees and uh, aircraft. So uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, any questions, Sonia or Deborah? So I've never actually heard of this angle of stalling before. I'm a little concerned. Is this something that could happen when in a commercial aircraft? Is this like a very steep angle, or is it different in every aircraft? A uh, stalling angle? Yeah. Uh, well, basically, if you're on a commercial airliner just traveling across to a different country, then you're not going to be going anywhere near the stall angle. Uh, it's more worrying for... Uh, it's more of a worry for things like the red arrows when they're doing their uh, when they, when they're doing their um, acrobatics. And I oh. apologize, I'm not sure what's happened to my camera there. But I'm sure I'll come back in a minute. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, there we go. And yeah, it's not something that you ever are likely to have to worry about unless your aircraft is either doing something it's not designed for, or you're in very bad air conditions, because I believe, I can't remember this exactly, but I believe it actually depends on the uh, wind conditions at the time as well. And then of course you've always got to be going at a certain speed in order to be able to keep the lift going, because the faster you're going, the more air effectively you're pushing downwards, so the bigger the force is of keeping you uh, keeping you alive. All right, thank you. Okay, and uh, Deborah, I, I believe you've got something a lot more high-tech than uh, wings for us. Well, I don't know if it's more high-tech. Um, it's actually something that's been happening for a lot longer. So I'm going to talk about fusion. And I say that it's been happening for a long time because this is actually what's happening in every star in the solar, or every star in the universe, and specifically in the sun that's heating our solar system. So first, to introduce you to what fusion is. So fusion would be a type, uh, most of the thing of is nuclear generation of power. And this specific type of power is considered much safer and more environmentally friendly than fission, which is what currently happens in nuclear power plants. Uh, my image, at least, has switched over to show the SciCam logo. So Michael, I don't know if you can fix that. Um, so right now we have fission power plants. And what fission does, and I'll show you an image to help clarify this, is 
you get this image of a screen and you have these two heavy atoms. So heavy means they have a lot of nucleons. So this thing's contained within the nucleus of an atom. So that's the protons and neutrons, if you've heard those words before. And you'll have these very heavy atoms, and they're going to push together. Or sorry, you'll have one heavy atom. I have to make sure I can see what you guys see. I mean, some slight technical difficulties. I started out quickly. You'll have the one heavy atom. This is the uranium-235 that you'll hear about. And this will get hit with essentially a small particle called a neutron. And this will break into two smaller but still heavy atoms. This, in this image I've showed you, you have barium and krypton. And this is currently used to generate a lot of energy. This is the fission that occurs in the current nuclear power plants. But the problem with this is that everything is radioactive. So the uranium you're putting in is radioactive, and as well the products you're producing tend to be radioactive. So you have a lot of issue with storing and disposing of this radioactive material. So why fusion is considered so advantageous is because it takes two very small and much less dangerous atoms and combines them or fuses them to make a slightly larger but still very not radioactive, not harmful product. And I'll show you this image here. And here, again, sorry, here looking at deuterium and tritium. So those are actually two different isotopes of hydrogen. So you've all heard of hydrogen. If you're not familiar with deuterium and tritium, all that isotope means is that it's mostly the same atom, or sorry, the same element, but it has a slightly different weight. So deuterium and tritium are slightly heavier versions of the normal hydrogen that we're aware of. So in a fusion reaction, deuterium and tritium combine, and they produce helium, which you've come into, uh, if you've ever blown up a balloon, you've come into contact with, as well as a lot of energy. So deuterium and helium are totally not radioactive, not even reactive much on their own, and so they're very fine for humans to deal with. Tritium is slightly radioactive, but much less so than uranium. In addition, fusion produces much more energy than fission. So if we could get fusion reactors working and replace our fission reactors, which we have all sorts of trouble with, replace our coal reactors, which are environmentally damaging, it would really be a great energy source for humankind. The problem with, fit, sorry, with fusion is that we can't exactly do it at the moment. So the sun's been doing this for many, many years, uh, probably in the neighborhood of six billion, but it was started by, we're not even sure exactly what, but some large input of energy. And it's now a self-sustaining reaction. So what we need to figure out how to do is start the reaction ourselves, which will probably involve a large input of energy, but then have it be self-sustaining. And this is what we're having difficulty with at the moment. So there's two ways that this is being attempted. One way is through internal confinement. So this means that you take a plasma. A plasma is actually the fourth state of matter. So there's solid, liquid, and gas that you're aware of. And then there's a fourth state called plasma. This doesn't really exist on Earth. It can be man-made, and it exists in the universe. And it's essentially uh, an ionized, uh, it's essentially an ionized gas, so gases with a positive and negative charge. And plasma tends to be very reactive, which is why it's used at the start. So if you have internal confinement type fusion, then you essentially just compress this plasma and eventually shoot it with a laser and hope that fusion starts and then becomes a self-sustaining reaction. The other option that you have is magnetic confinement fusion. And this tends to be called, in a reactor, called a tom tokamak? Sorry, uh, not a word I'm used to saying. So if you have this tokamak and then you use magnetic confinement, and again, you push this plasma very, very close together until you initiate fusion. So these are the two types that people are looking at, and different groups are looking at different ones to essentially see which one we can get working first. And at the moment, actually, there's been some consider it major, some consider it minor, but everyone will agree a breakthrough in internal confinement fusion. And this has happened at the National Ignition Facility, which is t uh, in the Lawrence Livermore National Labs, just near San Francisco in the United States. And they've actually managed to get more energy out of a fusion reaction than they put in, which is huge news, because this is what we've been trying to do for about 60 years. Unfortunately, they did cheat ever so slightly because 
Although they got more energy out of the fuel than they put in, they didn't count the energy that it took to initiate the laser beam. And it wasn't self-sustaining. So while it is definitely progress, it's not as much progress as we're hoping for. So now that I've talked about putting in more energy than we get out, that brings me into the Q factor. So everything that's important in fusion deals with what's called the Q factor. And this is a ratio of the energy put in versus the energy we got out. And obviously, fusion's only desirable if we can get out more energy than we're putting in. So we need a Q factor greater than 1, certainly. And ideally, we actually want a Q factor around 10, even up to 25 for commercial power plants. So the, um, this laboratory in the USA, they got a Q factor just above 1, not counting the energy put into the laser pulse, and it was unsustainable. So definitely progress, but not quite there. We have done simulations that show we can get a Q factor of 1.25. So that means we're getting out 25% more energy than we're putting in. But that's still not the 10 to 25 that we need. So why are we even talking about this if we're only simulating 1.5 and we need 10? Well, simulations, and I am actually a simulation-based chemist, so I trust them, but there is only so much that we can do with them. And also, even at this laboratory in the USA, they have only done a relatively small-scale reaction. So that brings us to JET, or the Joint European Taurus. And this is a fusion facility. It's actually right in the neighborhood of the UK. It's in Oxfordshire. And this is a magnetic confinement plasma. And this is the largest operational experimental fusion reactor that's currently going. And this is looking at using actual large experiments to see if we can get these high cues. And so far, they've gotten it to about 0.9, so they're getting there. It's not quite there yet. There's a bit of a race between internal confinement and magnetic to see which one will work better. But definitely, JET is paving the way and is doing a very good job. However, it's still not as big as we need overall, which brings us to ITER, or ITER. I'm not sure how they prefer it to be pronounced. And this is the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor. And ITER is also Latin for the road. So this is a reactor that's in the south of France at the moment. It's the largest tom tokamak reactor. So that's the magnetic confinement reactor, again, in the world. And this is in the process of being built in the south of France by an international group. So it's hosted by the European Union, which is contributing 45% of the cost. And then there are another six countries that are contributing 9% of the cost each. And those are India, Japan, China, Russia, South Korea, and the USA. So obviously you can see that the entire or large part of the international world is very interested in get, making fusion a reality because energy is so important and it's such a great potential for environmentally friendly energy. So this reactor went into construction in 2007. They've hit some roadblocks in the construction. It's cost more than they expected, which does seem to be the case with construction. But they're still expecting it to be done in 2019. And this reactor is going to be absolutely huge. Combined, it's going to weigh three times the amount of the Eiffel Tower. So that's 33, sorry, 23,000 tons. And it's actually in that only going to have 0.5 grams of fuel. So half a gram of this plasma that contains the tritium and the deuterium. So what is the rest of the weight going to go into? Well, it's going to have a torus, or the actual area where the fusion reaction takes place. And I'll show you a picture of this so you know what I'm talking about. And that's shown here. So as you can see, it's just this donut-shaped reactor. And this is where the fuel will go in and where you will initiate the reaction. And actually, while showing you pictures is nice, I can show you one that has been functional. And this is an actual image of an act, the jet reactor that's in Oxfordshire in the UK. I can't show you an uh, image of the already made ITER reactor, ITER reactor yet because it's still under construction. But so as you can see, you get these donut-shaped reactors. These are called the Taurus, generally stainless steel. And this will be about 30 meters squared. And again, this in and of itself will weigh about the same amount of the Eiffel Tower to store your half a gram of fuel. Then going to be 18 huge magnets surrounding this, and these will weigh about 360 tons each. So again, we're talking about a lot of weight to contain this. And the reason why you need so much is partly to initiate the reaction and partly to control it. 
So for anyone who's a superhero freak like me, if you've seen the original series, Spider-Man 2, with Dr. Otto Octavius, he actually creates a fusion reaction that he then dies trying to control because he's trying to control it with these little robotic hand things. It isn't good enough. And you can see now why it's not good enough because you will need a giant facility to control this. So, and you'll have this vacuum vessel with the fuel in it, and hopefully this 0.5 grams of fuel will generate about as much electricity as a current coal-fired power plant. That's about 500 megawatts. And although theoretically this energy could be used, it's actually just going to be vented because the whole purpose of ITER is to make sure that we can do this at all, not actually to generate energy for use. And generating the energy for use will just add another level of complexity that they don't want to deal with. So theoretically, it'll generate the amount of energy of a coal-fired power plant. What it's really going to be used for is to show that fusion is possible. Once we show that fusion is possible, hopefully this will happen in the next five years, we'll build DEMO, which is a short form for the demonstration power plant. Personally, I think not the most creative name. But the DEMO will be built assuming that ITER is successful, and it will be the first, at least in part, commercial power plant. So this will be expected to produce as much energy as a nuclear power plant. And so this will start, if it is successful, we'll be able to start placing the nuclear power plants we have in play, as well as those we're planning to build, and hopefully older power plants that run on fossil fuels as well. However, to go to demo, that will have to have a Q value of 25, meaning it's producing 25 times as much energy as is being put into it. This will be going up from ITER, which will produce 5 to 10 times, which is going up from the current lab in the US, which can produce about 1, depending on how you do the calculation. It's a little more or a little less. So fusion is definitely a ways off. However, I thought it was important to talk about it on today's episode of SciCam, because there has been this breakthrough at the International Laboratory in the USA. And even though it can seem as though a minor breakthrough because there's a lot more to do. It shows that we have potential and we're getting there. And this is just an incredible form of energy production. This will allow us to replace the radioactive plants we're worried about, the carbon plants that we're worried about, and we we'll really just give humans the next step forward that we need. So cross your fingers that ITER and DEMO go as planned because this could be a turning point for humanity with a new energy source. Thanks very much. Any questions, Michael? Oh, well, um just uh, how confident are people that they're going to be able to get from this Q factor of 1 all the way up to Q factor of 25? Because that sounds like a massive jump. It is a very large jump. So obviously, uh, six individual companies, and, or sorry, individual countries, and all of the EU have put a substantial amount of money into building ITER. So they have quite a lot of hope that it will work. However, in a recent interview done by the person that just made this minor discovery at the National Ignition Facility in the USA, said that he still thinks in having running fusion, he wouldn't put an exact number on it, but when pressed, he said a couple decades. So there is some, something to say about how much time and how much money we put into it. It is a larger facility than the National Ignition Facility, so it is possible they have more hope that way. And they're also looking at different types of fusion where the National Ignition Facilities looking at confinement base it is looking at magnetic base. So if we're lucky magnetic base will be magnetic base will be the one to go and it will progress much faster. But definitely depends who you ask on that. And I suppose when you were talking about uh, moving towards taking it commercial, one of the uh, engineering problems they're going to have to solve is making sure they can take the energy out and get it back in because once once you've got like several times coming out, several times more energy coming out than you actually put in, then obviously you just want to send some of that straight back in so you don't have to worry about it anymore, basically. Uh, well, ideally it will be a self-sustaining reaction, so any energy that actually comes out of the facility will be able to harness. It is more complicated than that because we will be using the reactors itself to generate more tritium to use as more fuel. So, in fact, creating a self-sustaining reaction is much, much more difficult than just making a one-off fusion. But it is being taken into account with the designs of these plants. So I like to think that it's helpful. So I uh, have one question. So you said about the sun having fusion going on. Mm -hmm. Presumably that's magnetically contained? Because the sun has quite a large magnetic field? Or does anyone really know? 
To my knowledge, it's magnetically contained, but to be honest, I spent most of my time researching fusion on Earth, not in the universe, so I'm not probably the right person to ask. <laughs> Fair Either enough. Astrologist. We have actually got a uh, fusion question from one of our audience members watching us online, uh, Jens. Um, he says, doesn't fusion turn the reactor materials themselves, by which I'm guessing he means the walls, into radioactive materials because they're emitting and absorbing so many neutrons? So ideally, we would actually use that to our advantage. We would make the walls of the reactor out of something that can be used to turn into tritium, because there's very little tritium on the Earth right now, and so we'd actually use the reactor to generate the tritium, which we then put back into the reactor to produce more energy. Certainly, I hadn't been clear if I said there would be no issue with radioactivity related to these plants, but substantially less than the current fission-based plants, which have a very radioactive initial fuel and a quite radioactive output weight. Yeah, because that's the big problem with the current uh, fission reactors, that we've got such a big radioactive fuel that we've got to store somewhere, and that's not an easy problem to solve. Oh, okay, thank you. And uh, we've actually got a, a question for you uh, as well, Sonia. Oh, okay. Uh, Someone's suggesting that uh, uh, Frank says, perhaps a new DNA in genetically modified plants gave the tobacco virus the information it needed to jump over to infecting bees. Uh, if, is, could, that, could that be the case? Um, <coughs> certainly. Hmm. I mean, bacteria are very good at taking up DNA, but I think really... Um, it would have been the virus itself because viruses are very fast at evolving and one of the reasons that actually plants end up vulnerable to viruses in the first place is that um, viruses replicate at such a fast rate and also when they replicate their DNA they don't actually check for errors um, which eukaryotic systems do to preserve their DNA sequence so you get mutations and evolution effectively a lot faster in viruses. So I would suspect it was the virus itself because as far as I'm aware there wouldn't be a gene within a plant that would allow a plant to grow within the bee which is what the virus really needs. Um, certainly I mean at the end of the day the bee and the plant are both eukaryotes so they might have some similarities. Um, but yeah I think it's probably the virus. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that, uh, Sonia. Um, that's everything for this um, month's episode of SciCam. But we've got a very special episode of SciCam coming up next month because on Saturday the 15th of March at 7pm GMT, we are going to be doing a show live from the Cambridge Science Festival. And that's going to be a bit, bit of a longer show, probably about an hour long. Uh, we're going to have lots of different guests uh, still confirming the last ones of those, but it looks like we're going to be mixing in some science poetry uh, as well as uh, the standard beginner's guides and uh, looks at papers. So that's something to get in your diaries. The uh, event for that will go up on Google Plus very shortly and the link will be there. So uh, follow SciCam on Google Plus, follow SciCam on Facebook and we'll hopefully see you there. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sonia. Bye-bye. And uh, thank you, Deborah. Thanks. Bye. Yeah. Bye-bye, everyone.